So next, um, we'll have Nadine Faza come up, and she's our Advanced Structural Imaging Fellow, uh, who's really um, sort of developing a, a niche as an expert in PVL assessment and closure. Uh, so, uh, Nadine. Thank you, Dr. Barker. It's an honor being here. Um, we'll shift gears from the valves to the paravivalar space, which is equally important. Um, I have no disclosures. The learning objectives for my talk are, one, to review the risk factors and complications of PVL, differentiate paravivalar leaks from normal washing jets, and finally, to review the use of multimodality imaging in the diagnosis and percutaneous closures of paravivalar leaks. So paravalvular leaks complicate about 5 to 18% of all implanted surgical valves. They're detected in 2 to 10% of valves in the aortic position and 7 to 17% um, of valves in the mitral position. And these are usually diagnosed, usually 74% are diagnosed in the first year postoperatively. The risk factors for developing paravalvular leaks include a history of endocarditis, significant mitral annular calcification, steroid use. Mechanical valves have a high risk of developing PVLs as compared to bioprosthetic valves. Supraannular valves also are more likely to, de to develop PVL uh, compared to other ones. And the surgical risk plays a role where continuous sutures pose a greater risk compared to interrupt interrupted sutures. PVLs are usually asymptomatic and only symptomatic in up to 5% of the population. The features include heart failure. A lot of patients come with shortness of breath, lower extremity edema, fluid overload symptoms. Hemolytic anemia is another clinical feature, and some patients require repeated blood transfusions. So it's important to order labs like LDH, haptoglobin, reticulocyte counts. And the last complication includes infective endocarditis. Indications for percutaneous closures of PVLs include symptomatic heart failure and persistent hemolytic anemia with anatomic features that are suitable for percutaneous closure. Contraindications include active infective endocarditis and significant dehiscence involving more than a fourth to a third of the valve ring. Multimodality imaging plays a role in the, di in the diagnosis and procedural guidance during percutaneous PVL closures. Transthoracic echo is a primary modality for the diagnosis, and it's usually challenging, and there are usually subtle clues because of significant acoustic shadowing by these prosthetic valves. And they're also used for follow-up after percutaneous PVL closure. TE is very helpful, especially with the use of 3D in determining the location and the extent of such defects. It plays a key role in procedural guidance in the cath lab during percutaneous closure. And it's also important for evaluation of immediate complications post-deployment. CT is very helpful in planning by determining the location and the extent of the defect. CMR is used for more accurate volumetric assessment when there are multiple leaks or multivalvular lesions. We'll start with a case. This is a patient with a mechanical mitral valve. And you can see systolic flow um, through that valve. Do you think this is a paravalvular leak or not? So it's important to differentiate perivalvular leaks from norm normal washing jets associated with mechanical valves. The key features of normal washing jets, which are not pathological, are that they're located inside the valve ring. So you can see them inside the valve ring right here. They're focused around the hinge points, and they point inwards. So these are the features of normal washing jets that are seen in mechanical prosthesis, and these are normal and not pathological. We're going to start with a case of a mitral uh, paravalvular leak to demonstrate the role of imaging in diagnosis and procedural guidance. 
This is a 65-year-old female with bioprosthetic mitral valve who presented with heart failure symptoms. This is a pedisternal lung axis view, and you see that the uh, mitral bioprosthesis is slightly tilted, but on color uh, interrogation of the um, valve, there isn't much systolic color flow to suggest the presence of mitral regurgitation. But again, as we said, these cases are challenging to diagnose um, on, on, T, on TTE because of the acoustic shadowing. Then we got the apical views, and the valve is again slightly tilted, and we can't appreciate a lot of color um, to make us suspect mitral regurgitation. There was a subtle clue, though. When we did the uh, continuous wave um, interrogation across the valve, the gradient was elevated. And we when we compared the flow across the mitral valve to that of the aortic valve, there was suggestion that there's um, mitral regurgitation. So we obtained our transesophageal echocardiogram. And as you can see here, there's a lateral paravalvular jet that's clearly located outside of the valvular ring. Then we obtained the 3D images, and you can see a defect around 11 o'clock anterolaterally. And we always apply color to make sure this is not just dropout, and there's significant paravalvular regurgitation located anterolaterally. We got a CAT scan, which also demonstrated the presence of this anterolateral paravalvular leak. And CAT scans are important to determine the size and extent and help in procedural planning. So we took the patient to the cath lab for percutaneous closure. We started the transeptal puncture about four, four and a half centimeters above the mitral valve plane. In this case, we used fusion imaging, whereby we used uh, 3D CT images and overlaid these 3D landmarks from the CT on the fluoroscopy um, screen uh, for imaging guidance. <coughs> We're currently conducting a study to demonstrate the effect of the use of fusion imaging on the time to cross the interatrial septum and the time to cross uh, the PVL defect. So we started by passing a wire through the anterolateral defect right here. And this demonstrates the use of um, 3D imaging during the procedure. We deployed a VSD occluder in the defect you can see it right here. We checked with color Doppler, and there was still residual regurgitation anterior to the device that we placed. And on 2D imaging, you could still see that regurgitation. We moved on to wiring the residual defects. And this is important because every time you wire and there's a device, you have to re-image and make sure that the device is stable and has not moved. We then deployed a second device, a ductal occluder, anterior to the previously deployed device. And you can see both devices uh, on this 3D image. And with color 3D, there was trace residual regurgitation compared to what we had before. And this was confirmed by um, the 2D imaging, trace residual regurgitation. At the end of the procedure, it's very important to check for complications. We have to make sure that the device, or the devices in this case, did not cause any prosthetic valve obstruction. So we checked the gradients across the valve, and the mean gradient across the mitral valve was two. And we checked the floor screen and make sure the device is well positioned in relationship to the prosthetic valve. And you can see we have an iatrogenic ASD, but the shunting is predominantly left to right. Checking for, for the pericardial effusion is also very important after such cases. We will move on to an aortic paravalvular leak case. This is a 69-year-old gentleman with a mechanical aortic valve who presented with hemolysis requiring multiple transfusions. We got the baseline TTE. It's not very clear, but there was suggestion, suggestion that there was some aortic uh, regurgitation, which was more evident on the short axis views, close to the site where you usually have the right coronary cusp. 
Then we obtained the transesophageal echocardiogram for more accurate assessment of the perivabular leak. And we could see a more anterior jet. And we explained through it to determine how many jets we had. I don't know why these are playing. OK. So on the trans uh, gastric views right here, the deep ones, you can see two jets. But in fact, there's one jet that's located more anteriorly, and it's an directed posteriorly, giving the illusion of a second defect. We obtained the CT, which also showed the presence and confirmed the presence of a perivabular leak. The patient was taken to the cath lab for a percutaneous closure. A wire was placed through that defect. And a VSD occluder was deployed. We check on the long axis view and the short axis view. On the long axis view, it does look like the device is obstructing the valve. But if you look at the short axis views, it's not affecting the valve opening. That's why it's important to get multiple views, different angles, to make sure there's no valve obstruction. And there was only trace, if any, residual aortic regurgitation. So the jet we were dealing with was the more um, anterior one, and it was directed posteriorly. Again, it's important to screen for complications. If you look at the fluoro image, the valve is right here, and this is the device, and it's not affecting the movement of the discs. We get deep transgastric gradients through the valve and through the LVOT to make sure we don't have any valve obstruction. And the Doppler velocity index was 0.41. The normal is more, normal is more, point, more than 0.25. There's, there's no valve obstruction. And we check the aorta for any dissection after an intervention, in addition to checking for a pericardial effusion. Another thing we do um, when we plan for these procedures is 3D printing, where we use CT data in addition to TE data to create patient-specific 3D models. This first one is a model for an aortic prosthetic valve. And these help with determining the location, the size, and the size of the percutaneous device that we use for closing the defect. And this is another example of a mitral uh, valve with the, the plugs that we use for closure. In summary, PVLs can be challenging to diagnose. And the use of multimodality imaging aids in the assessment of complex cases. TEE and fusion imaging are used for procedural guidance. And imaging is key for immediate procedural complications after PVL closures. Thank you. So Nadine, before you go, that was great. Um, but you didn't give yourself enough credit. She's, she's heading up. Um, a funded uh, study that we're doing uh, to try to optimize this technique and improve um, procedural times. Do you mind just telling us about that project in, in, a, in a few minutes about the problem? Um, so we're currently conducting a, a clinical trial with um, Siemens. Um, we're enrolling patients and randomizing them blindly into undergoing PVL closure with fusion imaging in the cath lab. CT imaging on the floor screen versus no immediate use of uh, fusion imaging. And we're uh, trying to determine the effect of the use of fusion imaging on the time to cross the transeptal, um, to get the transeptal puncture through, and to pass the wire through the PVL defect. Um, so we're currently enrolling. If you have any patients with PVL, give me a call. <laughs> Can you start your talk name? Always say PVL is a <laughs> yeah, we never see PVL, but we have two cases on Monday. Um, but it's and it's particularly important, I think, in the aortic position. Um, as as Nadine illustrated, it's it's very tough, and and John pointed this out as well, to image sort of anterior structures and, and the aortic valve when there's a lot of hardware in there, and a lot of times the defect is uh, anterior, and your TE probe obviously is coming from posterior. It, it can be a challenge um, to image, but when you have the screen and you can put a dot on your fluoro screen of, of where the defect is, it can make what used to be a procedure that took anywhere from one and a half to two hours to 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so it's, it's very helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank you.